So today we'll be talking about the disaster movie Don't Look Up. In the case of real life disasters, you're going to want to be prepared. So let's hear from our sponsor today, My Patriot Supply. Friends, the time to prepare for bad times is during good times. If you know a big storm is coming, you prepare in advance. Same goes for our nation's future. Things seem calm right now, so it's the perfect time to prepare for the next big crisis. That's why we recommend stocking up on emergency food from My Patriot Supply. They're America's number one preparedness company, with millions of happy, well-prepared customers. Their food lasts up to 25 years in storage. It's an insurance policy you can eat. When you need it, it will be there. And right now, you can save $50 on a four-week emergency food kit. The kit provides breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, and snacks, totaling over 2,000 calories a day. Every family in America should have one of these. So go to preparewithsteven.com and save $50 on your four-week food kit. That's preparewithsteven.com. Steven with a PH. Do it before the peanut butter hits the fan. Go to preparewithsteven.com. Hi everyone, today I'll be doing a somewhat unusual video. I'll be reviewing a film. It will not be a traditional review, however. As the title suggests, I'll be talking about the politics underpinning Adam McKay's newest film, Don't Look Up. In case you happen to stumble upon this video and you're completely unfamiliar with me, I don't usually review media and I have no plan to do so going forward. This is probably a one-off. Don't subscribe with the expectation of anything else like it anytime soon. In case you're concerned about spoilers, I will not be giving away the ending here, but I will be going over significant portions of the plot. First off, before I get into the politics, let me just say that, even though I largely disagreed with the movie's message overall, I actually didn't think it was bad. It had its funny moments, and I genuinely thought the acting was good. If you like Adam McKay's other work, you'll probably like this film as well. If the Netflix numbers are any indication, it looks as though the film is very popular with the general public. Let me also say, right off the bat, that while the screenplay was written by Adam McKay, the guy who came up with the story originally was David Sirota. Sirota is a left-wing commentator, journalist, and former speechwriter for Bernie Sanders during his 2020 presidential campaign. His politics are definitely not mine. Anyways, the movie starts out with Kate Dibiaski, a PhD candidate for astronomy, played by Jennifer Lawrence, discovering a comet when looking through a telescope at an observatory. She notifies her professor, Dr. Randall Mindy, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, who proceeds to calculate the trajectory of the comet, only to find out that it's barreling towards the Earth. Given the size of the comet, should it hit the Earth, which they believe it will with over 99% certainty, it will spell immediate death for every living creature on this planet. The film follows these two as they proceed to warn the planet that the comet is coming, only to find out that no one seems capable of responding to the situation with the urgency it needs. This may sound weird, but this film actually reminded me of my favorite television show, The Wire. I believe both are fundamentally about institutional failure. The Wire examines several institutions within the city of Baltimore. The police, the media, the educational system, the political system, and so on. All of these institutions fail to meet their stated objectives, and instead, the people who comprise them only advance their own interests. So too with Don't Look Up. Early on in the film, Dibiaski and Mindy make an appeal to the authorities. They tell the head of the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, a department within the federal government, Dr. Teddy Oglethorpe, played by Rob Morgan. Oglethorpe arranges a meeting with the president, Ginny Orlean, played by Meryl Streep. Orlean doesn't seem to have much time for the scientists, as she puts their meeting off till the very end of the day, and she doesn't seem terribly concerned with their findings, as she's more worried about the midterms, which are a couple of weeks away, and a controversy involving her latest Supreme Court nominee. While President Orlean's party affiliation is never officially stated, there is some evidence to suggest that she's supposed to be a Democrat, as there is a picture of her with former Democratic President Bill Clinton in the background. For the most part, though, her party affiliation is left ambiguous. After failing to persuade the political authorities to take action, Oglethorpe persuades Mindy and Dibiaski to take their case to the media. They proceed to schedule a media appearance on a morning talk show, The Morning Rip, which is clearly a parody of the real-life morning show, Morning Joe, on MSNBC. There's a central talk show that, I, I don't want to give it away, but I think if you look, mm -hmm. if you look at Tyler Perry and Kate Blanchett, you'll, you'll get the idea of... of 
which talk show in corporate media that it kind of takes its inspiration mm. from. Like the political authorities, the hosts of The Morning Rip, Jack Bremer, played by Tyler Perry, and Brie Eventy, played by Kate Blanchett, treat the news of the coming apocalypse with the utmost triviality. They schedule the science segment at the end of the show, instead prioritizing celebrity gossip stories. When they finally get on the program, the scientists are asked nothing but silly questions by the hosts. Enraged by the fact that they're not taking the story seriously, Dibiaski flips out on air. Her boyfriend, who works at some BuzzFeed-esque clickbait rag, proceeds to publicly denounce her and publishes salacious details about their relationship. Mindy, however, is well received by the audience and becomes an Anthony Fauci-like media darling, which Mindy himself proceeds to lean into. After President Orlean gets involved in a sex scandal with her newest Supreme Court pick, she decides to start focusing on the comet as a means of distracting the public from her folly. Politically, her gamble pays off, as attention shifts away from her controversy to the comet, and her party is rewarded with sweeping victories in the midterms. Orlean's plan is to blow up the comet with a nuclear weapon, a plan that is aborted at the last minute thanks to an intervention from an eccentric tech billionaire and campaign donor to Orlean, Peter Isherwell, played by Mark Rylance. Isherwell's new strategy involves breaking the comet up in a more controlled way, which will allow significant portions of it to enter the Earth's atmosphere. Isherwell hopes that these portions of the comet will land safely in the ocean, and that his company will be able to harvest the remains for rare earth metals that are inside of it. Rare earth metals, conveniently enough, are vital components in tech products that Isherwell sells. The White House proceeds to hire Mindy to be their national science advisor, in order to gain from his good reputation with the public. Mindy accepts and proceeds to lead into his new pseudo-celebrity role, advocating for the potential commercial benefits from harvesting the metals that comprise the comet. Mindy ultimately comes to his senses and has a falling out with the administration over their lack of seriousness dealing with the planet's impending doom. Mindy, Dibiaski, and Oglethorpe start a social media campaign with the slogan, Just Look Up imploring others to take action to prevent the annihilation of the Earth. This mantra is co-opted by President Orlean's political opposition, as well as virtue-signaling celebrities and social media personalities. Orlean and her allies launch a counter-campaign with the mantra, Don't Look Up, leaning heavily into the narrative of denialism and accusing their opponents of being alarmists. The controversy is hashed out in newsrooms and on social media in ways that are pretty close to real life. As I said earlier, I believe the film is about institutional failure. Specifically, I take it to be a critique of how the various power centers of our society fail to deal with collective action problems. A collective action problem is defined by Wikipedia as a situation in which all individuals would be better off cooperating, but fail to do so because of conflicting interests between individuals that discourage joint action. In the case of Don't Look Up, the comet is the collective action problem, obviously, and all of the institutions that should be addressing it and would ultimately benefit in the long term from its destruction and could do something to help facilitate that outcome are more preoccupied with their more narrow, short-term interests. The politicians are more concerned about their party winning elections. The media is more concerned about ratings than reporting on a story with the magnitude it deserves. Industry leaders are more concerned with profiting from the comets than getting rid of it outright. This film, to its credit, pulls no punches. Even the scientists are not exempt from criticism, as Mindy exploits the situation by embracing his newfound celebrity over telling the public what they need to hear. The comet, as you may have guessed, is a not-so-subtle allegory for climate change. Though, according to David Sirota, the logic could be applied to many other problems as well. And by the way, it goes beyond just climate change, right? I mean, the, it, it, when, when this movie was being made, it, it was a climate allegory, but then the pandemic came up and, and there's been all sorts of, of rejection of, of basic science when it comes to that. And I think what it's really about is can we as a society anymore, when we have uncomfortable facts that we need to deal with, uh, immovable facts, uh, uh, crises that are bearing down on us that cannot be negotiated with, According to these people, on so many fronts, we are collectively whistling past the graveyard. So, where do I take issue with this film? Again, overall, I liked it. But I do think that its message has some serious flaws. People like Alex Epstein have pushed back against the idea of analogizing a world-destroying comet with climate change. Epstein believes that you're simply not comparing like with like. And I tend to agree. I'd say this is even more true with COVID-19. 
as tragic as the deaths from that virus have been, it's simply not an apocalyptic event. A lot of people have also pointed out to the hypocrisy of many people involved in the film. There's certainly something to that as well. A number of cast members have engaged in precisely the sort of virtue signaling that the film lampoons. Leonardo DiCaprio famously gallivants around the globe on a private jet while calling on people to reduce their carbon footprints. My favorite example of hypocrisy actually comes from the media critique. The film bemoans the celebrification of news and politics even though Adam McKay himself has contributed to this in a significant way. As I said earlier, The Morning Rip is a thinly veiled parody of Morning Joe. In the 2012 film The Campaign, which was co-written by Adam McKay, the cast of Morning Joe was actually played by Joe, Mika, and Willie themselves, covering the fictitious campaign. So the charges of hypocrisy are very real, but they're honestly not what I take issue with. Given that David Sirota was involved with the film, populist interpretations of it are pretty well grounded. This is clear. It's part of the premise of the movie, is that the corrupt politicians, by the way, controlled by their donors, and that's why it's doing really well, not just among the left wing, but also among actual right wing viewers, right? Right wing politicians don't like it. Democratic politicians generally don't like it because it's lampooning them. Mainstream media really doesn't like it, uh, but it's got great ratings from everyone else. Everybody's watching it uh, all over the world, all over America, et cetera, because it resonates with us because we all know that the politicians and the media are full of crap. And its critiques of our institutions definitely have their points, even if there is some hypocrisy attached to them. For example, the celebrification of news and politics is something that news people have embraced and invited in with open arms. Just look at the way mainstream media loved the show House of Cards. Many media personalities appeared on that show as themselves to cover the fictional politics within that universe. They also seem to love the show out of some desperate need for their jobs to be more interesting than they actually are. My issue is not that its critiques of our institutions are necessarily invalid, it's that they're incomplete. If you look at all the institutions that fail to react to the problem correctly, almost all of them do so, all the while giving regular people exactly what they want. The politicians are concerned about getting reelected rather than solving the problem of the comet. Okay, and who are the ones who vote for politicians in an election? It's not as though politicians pop out of the ground and find themselves holding office. People almost always vote them into the positions they're in. What about the tech wizard, who wants to profit off the comet rather than destroying it in its entirety? Sure, that seems irresponsible, but he's only going to profit from the rare earth metals in the comet because he knows that the public will buy the products that he will make from them. And what about the media? Certainly, its coverage of serious subjects is trivial, in the movie, just as it is in real life. Why do they cover news this way? Well, once again, it's because that's what the people would prefer to watch. I'm sure this is true in the fictional world of Don't Look Up, because it is absolutely true in the real world. Forget about the corporate media, or cable television, or anything else that can be considered mainstream. Just look at independent outlets. Every single one of them, in their honest moments, will tell you that people care way more about drama videos than they do about the serious stuff. Share this segment far and wide, please. You know, every now and then we cover these stories that are just really substantive, and unfortunately the way it works on YouTube is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You guys like it much more if I'm doing some segment on Ben Shapiro or Steven Crowder or Alex Jones, and it's conflict-driven, and it's that sort of stuff. That's what sells more on YouTube. This stuff I'm telling you guys right now, unfortunately, does not generate the views. Part of that's because of the algorithm and they try to suppress us. But there is a genuine uh, issue here from the audience perspective that it just does It's not as sexy. People don't want to click on a video about Iran and foreign policy nearly as much as they want to click on one about personal conflict and debate. Man, there's some stories, guys, for lack of a better word. I don't know why I've been using this a lot lately. They're bangers. Right. <laughs> and they're like word. the stories that I actually do. I, like they, they fire me up and I'm excited to share them with people. And like they always do so poorly and it makes me so depressed. Uh, like the thing that I did about the Carlisle group and Biden. Come on, guys, share that video. It didn't do well. <laughs> it makes me really sad. <laughs> no, no, I'm never sad about that. Look, of course, I wish that they would get more views. But look, this is something important you should know as members. We know the things that don't get views, we do them anyway. 
because they're important stories. I'd lose my mind if we didn't do those stories. Yeah. Are you kidding me? People would rather see someone get humiliated or see people they enjoy watching tear each other apart than serious deep dives into issues. If you don't believe me, look at the view counts on any channel that talks about politics. I know it's true in my own case, both as a content creator and as a consumer of media. I get way more views on a video if I put someone controversial in the title, and I'm way more likely to click on a video if it seems like it's going to be a source of salacious drama. The need for entertainment isn't a fault in the media itself. The fault, to the extent that it is one, is with us. Certain people within the online commentariat have talked about the popularity of Don't Look Up in very self-congratulatory ways. When I was at MSNBC, I was routinely told, climate doesn't rate. Meaning like, nah, we can do the occasional climate change segment, but the audience, this is like feeding the audience vegetables. They really don't want to hear it. They're going to tune out. So better to cover, you know, whatever nonsense is happening in the sort of political reality um, TV world. You just made a film that is an allegory for climate change that makes a lot of really salient important points about how we failed as a society to deal with that threat and any another, other number of significant threats facing us and facing the world. And it is one of the most popular things that Netflix has ever put out. Which I think right. proves the point that if you cover climate in the right way, actually people are extremely interested in what is going on in this front. And I would argue that the, that the vast viewership of the movie uh, is validates the idea that there is a pent up demand for things that touch on the climate crisis. The fact that there are people who chastise the mainstream press for its triviality, yet think that a comedy movie is a triumph of serious political discourse, is something I find ironic to say the least. Given that these people often run their own clickbait internet shows that pretend to be serious discussions of the issues of the day, is even more ironic. People who never miss an opportunity to talk about the latest controversy involving Joe Rogan have no business accusing others of being trivial. If YouTube politics really is the benchmark for proper political discourse, then it's no wonder that our politics are so dysfunctional. It reminds me of something the late Neil Postman wrote about television in his book Amusing Ourselves to Death public discourse in the age of show business. I raise no objection to television's junk. The best things on television are its junk, and no one and nothing is seriously threatened by it. Besides, we do not measure a culture by its output of undisguised trivialities, but by what it claims as significant. Therein is our problem, for television is at its most trivial, and therefore most dangerous, when its aspirations are high, when it presents itself as a carrier of important cultural conversations. The irony here is that this is what intellectuals and critics are constantly urging television to do. Postman didn't take issue with stupid sitcoms, the Super Bowl, or America's Funniest Home Videos. Were he alive today, I'm sure he wouldn't even care about reality TV. Television was at its best when it was serving up slop to people. That's what television was for. And Postman didn't have an inherent problem with people consuming slop. What Neil Postman was worried about was 60 Minutes and Meet the Press. These shows were slop trying to pass themselves off as something serious and important. Postman's argument is slightly different than the one I'm making here. He thought that the medium of television, and I have no doubt were he alive today, he'd throw YouTube in with it, was inherently corrosive to news and politics because it necessarily made the serious trivial. I recommend you read the book if you're interested in his perspective. I don't know if it's just innate to visual media, but I do believe that our political discourse is silly and trivial, and that we shouldn't expect it to be otherwise. This is true even of the people who constantly congratulate themselves for how wonderful Don't Look Up is and how it bashes elites. Politics and governance is an inherently boring thing. In order to get more people to pay attention to it and have a public conversation about it, you have to make things entertaining. And like Postman thought about television, I think about modern political media in nearly all its forms. There's nothing wrong with entertainment. The problem with YouTube isn't PewDiePie or Mr. Beast. The problem with YouTube is Breaking Point's Secular Talk and The Young Turks. The former is honest entertainment, the latter is entertainment trying to pass itself off as something serious. 
And before you write that I have a political channel, therefore I'm being a hypocrite, the difference is that I don't view myself as doing something important, nor is changing the world or society my goal here. This channel is largely just an exercise in catharsis, and amazingly enough, some people actually like to watch. So to sum it all up, let's once again look at the institutions that Don't Look Up criticizes. Are they failing? I wouldn't say that they are. They're serving exactly the people they're supposed to, the people who comprise them. Of course politicians are fundamentally concerned about their re-election above all else. Of course captains of industry are looking at every situation from the perspective of advancing their business interests. Of course the media is concerned about covering topics that people will actually watch over covering what is important. They're always going to behave this way because the public enables it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We just need to approach collective action problems, to the extent that they actually exist, differently. Expecting these institutions to solve the very serious problems of our day is like expecting to fit a square peg in a round hole. The silly people are not the people who comprise these institutions. The silly people are the ones who expect them to behave differently. Mm.